Hello, Kidney Warriors! James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach. And this is another episode of Dadvice TV Live. And if you're new, don't forget to hop on over to YouTube and click that little subscribe button and hit the little bell. That way, every time a new Dadvice TV video gets published or is scheduled, you'll be one of the first to find out. Now, if you are new, let me briefly tell you who I am. My name's James. I was diagnosed just over two years ago now with stage five kidney failure. Mm, it was not good. I spent a week in the ICU. Now, I have not gone on dialysis. I have not received a transplant, but what I have done is made lifestyle and diet changes, and I have improved my overall health in general, which has helped get my energy back and help me kick kidney disease to the curb so that it is not holding me back. Now, we're not all able, you know, I was able to avoid the need for dialysis so far. One day, I might need to go on dialysis, but I've been able to avoid it and delay it, but we cannot all delay that so here with us you guys know him you guys love him welcome dr Cossum. but hey doctor how you doing good man how's it going guys how's it going Woohoo! hey we are doing great and we are going to talk about preparing for dialysis but before we do that let everyone know who you are so that they can hop on over to your YouTube channel and subscribe because we need you to hit a thousand subscribers after today's show. Yeah, that's the goal, right? That's the goal. I'm at 915 or something like that. And you really helped me out with growing my subscriber base. But I'm Dr. Cossumbutt. I'm a kidney doctor. I'm in San Antonio, Texas. I do a lot of social media. And when I mean I do a lot of social media, I don't show off my six pack abs. I don't dance funny dances. <laughs> I, I just educate and I try to educate in videos that are about two to five minutes long. And so you it's, it's quick, digestible. And I try to be a little bit funny, but it's, it's, it's great. And so I, I really enjoy it and I really love engaging with patients. So if you can hit over to to you, your kidneys, your health on on YouTube and Kasim Butt MD on you on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'm on those platforms as well, and I love engaging. So please, um, please, please like that page and comment on my sections. Uh, comment on those platforms for me. Yeah, and your videos are awesome. You 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 put a little style in there, a little bit of humor. Mm -hmm. And you keep them right yeah. on point. So they're nice and easy to digest. So if you guys out there, if you have not gone over and subscribed to Your Kidneys, Your Health on YouTube, please, you don't know what you're missing. Go on over there. Yeah. Putting out all sorts of great stuff. And I love that it's to the point, unlike myself, who's a talkaholic and just loves going on and going on. <laughs> about stuff yeah well, well this is fun it's a different type of engagement different type of interaction right but yep. <laughs> when i'm trying to talk about a subject high blood pressure i know there's a few things you need to know and then i divide the videos up into five sections or whatever two three sections so that you can understand them but yeah no this is a great platform too because people get to interact with us which is not yep. something i get to do often yeah we see lots of regular and one of your videos um recently that i encourage everyone to go check out you talked about urine, which is one of the most confusing things that kidney patients have, at least what I see on message boards, is urine, the bubbles, the protein, all of that stuff. And you got it so easy to figure out. Oh, yeah, and that's all you can need to know. And that's what I always feel like kidney patients, like when you go to a doctor's office, there's a set set of questions you should have every time you go to that doctor's office. Urine is one of them. And so particularly any blood in it and or any protein in it. And we'll talk about that in the video, but you know, like just knowing that, and it gives you reassurance because you have a marker to see how well you're doing, right? Not just the yep. GFR and the creatinine, but other things. So again, I, I love that video was one of my favorite videos because I just, just talked about urine and the things you need to know about it. And again, five minutes and you're done and, and go on there and just watch it two, three times to get it down in your head. So that's how I yep. like it. Now tonight we are going to be talking about something that I hope to delay ever needing to make the decision about and that is preparing for dialysis so yeah um, can you walk us through how we as kidney patients if the time comes how do we best prepare for dialysis so the way i want you all to do like i actually when i posted about this today you know i was talking about like 
several things, you know, timing of it, uh, symptoms, procedures you may need to go through. But I think if we're going to start this off right, I think you really need to talk about mindset, right? And how your mind is going into this. Now, what I love about you, James, you're an active person involved in their care about kidney disease. You want to know stuff. And I think I encourage everyone to want to know stuff. You see what I'm saying? I think I drive, I drove my doctors nuts in the beginning. Cause in the beginning I came in with the, you know, the, the 50 questions, every single visit, but yeah, yeah. Once we kind of got to know each other, they understood. It was very clear. I am going to be proactive. I'm looking for tips and recommendations from them and understanding. Yeah. And that helps me better implement their treatment strategy. And and now we work great together, all of my doctors. Yeah, yeah. So that that's what I love. I actually love patients that really ask questions and I don't feel, I want people to be able to feel intimidated. The last patient I saw at a clinic this morning, this afternoon or the second to last one wife was asking me all sorts of questions and I loved it and they were simple questions. So it makes me smart when I answer them. Right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in general, like, uh, it makes me sound smart at least, you know? So, but it's great as I can alleviate any of her fears. And so she was asking me these questions and it was awesome. And Patricia Bland is from Louisiana. I trained in Louisiana LSU. So hi, Patrice, Patrice Bland. Sorry. I trained out there, but I used um, to live in Alexandria. Andrea, Louisiana, right there in the middle at England wow. Air Force Base, which no longer exists. As a matter of fact, I was just talking with somebody last night on YouTube who shot a video driving around the old Air Force Base, and he cut yeah. the video off right before he got to where we lived. I was like, oh, I can't wait to see the street again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I know I trained at LSU in Shreveport, Louisiana, <coughs> which is like northern Louisiana, which is a little bit more like Texas than like south louisiana Mm -hmm. but um but in general what we were talking about was mindset so i really want y'all to first off be involved in your care and understand where you're going okay and knowing in the back of your mind that dialysis is a possibility at some point in the future all right and the best thing to do for you first off is understanding what dialysis is the different modalities and all that kind of stuff but understanding also that CKD is oftentimes progressive, meaning it gets worse over time, right? You may have a GFR of 35 today, but that 35 may not hold up. You know, Mm -hmm. it may decline and it depends on your disease process, right? If your disease process is diabetes, it's a possibility that's going to decline further. And if your diabetes is not controlled, it's going to decline faster, right? So, um, so that's the first thing I want you to understand that it is a possibility and do not be scared to talk about dialysis with your doctor. You know, first off, research it. I actually made a video called, um, what is it called? Dialysis Made Simple. Five minutes. Talks about the different forms of dialysis, right? But at the same time, you need to get comfortable with that. I have literally, James, I have patients that were refusing for me to ever talk about dialysis, even when their GFR was like low 20s or teens. They did not even want to hear it. And so (sighs) that makes the experience so much worse for them. You see Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So yeah, first off, we're I think talk about the timeline and that timeline, the more, you know, the better you can manage that timeline and be prepared for what's coming up next. With absolutely. Dialysis. Absolutely. The other thing I want y'all to understand with dialysis, you know, I have uh, another patient today and I'm, I don't mean to pick on my patients today, but I just got out of clinic. Right. So one of them was like, I never want dialysis. Right. And I'm not, I don't want it. I hated it. Blah, 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 blah. But I want y'all to understand when we offer dialysis to y'all, it's not because we want to right? It's not because we want to. It's because at a certain point, <clears throat> when your kidney function declines, typically less than 15%, um, there's a point where you have to choose between dialysis or death, meaning your kidney function is not strong enough to maintain life, mm-hmm. right? Or not, or, or functional life, right? So there's a certain point I'm going to offer it to you. So it's not like we're trying to force it on you, but we're trying to give you uh, give you that option and understand that that's where it is. Now, uh, the other thing I want you to understand too, James, you're a different category. You're 44, 45, right? 46, right? I what like your again? first guess. 43? 42 and a half. 42 and a half. Yeah, 40, I'm at the higher end of 40s. I hate to say that. Okay, we can talk about maturity level. I think that's about 23, right? Maturity is 23. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that yeah. one. <laughs> All right. All right. What kind of That's jokes you feel. like? 17. You're like 17. Yeah. What kind of jokes you like? Right? <laughs> all right. But um, but you're in a different category, right? But I've actually had patients that are 70, 80 years old saying, you know what? I have a full, I've had a full life. I don't want dialysis. Mm-hmm. So again, what's good about having the discussion early, you don't have to have it at the at two o'clock in the morning when it's emergent, right? So it's good to have these discussions early. So again, try to have that mindset about wanting to know, wanting to uh, understand that the progression is happening. Okay. So yep. I would say, um, but yeah. And but for as some far of us, timing, it is, 
inevitable dialysis. I, mean, I would love to never, ever go on dialysis. That would be ideal. Yeah. But at some point, if I need it to sustain life, I'm going to make sure I'm educated and I'm prepared and I'm going to understand the different uh, modalities and different types of dialysis yeah. and pick the one that works best for me and I'll go on it because I enjoy yeah. living. Yeah. And that's, that's where I'm at. You know, like, uh, that's where I, I want you guys to understand this. It's like, you, I don't want you to think it's the end of life. Like I've seen some people talk about dialysis, like it's the end of life and oh my God, it's horrible. And, and, um, yeah, that's me. Beverly Christian says, that's me. I don't want dialysis. Nobody wants dialysis, but exactly. again, if you think about it as think about it as the next phase, right. Or say as the bridge to a transplant, right. As, or as a bridge to a kidney transplant, yeah. that's how you have to start thinking guys. So I don't want you to think of dialysis and death. I want you to think of extending life, right? That's how I want you to start thinking about it, okay? And the more you're involved, the more you'll f feel in control and the more the different the experience will be, okay? Um, and, you know, so it's, it's different. So now when we're talking about this, right, like it's typically when the kidney function gets less than 30%, GFR less than 30 is when we talk about getting an axis in the arm, a dialysis axis in the arm, like a fistula or a graft, right? Um, now, why would you there. start talking at GFR 30? To help other people well, understand why, because um, it depends. Uh, well, well, it depends on the progression of kidney failure, right, or kidney kidney disease, right. So, I've had patients that had that had GFRs of 25, 30, 40, and they've been there for five, six, seven years, staying stable, right. Mm -hmm. But I've also had patients that I saw them the first time, 50, 45, 35, 30 decline. So it's not an, it's not a absolute cutoff. I want you to understand that. But when the GFR hits 30, 30 or less, typically that's when we start thinking maybe we need a dialysis access and how fast that's happening really counts. Right now I happen to wait for a GFR of 20 or less on my patients, um, before I get a dialysis access in the arm, the fistula or the graft, okay? uh -huh. that's where I wait. But I'm in a big, big city in the United States. Okay. San Antonio, Texas. I'm in a big group. 14, 15 physicians. We have all the logistical support. I'm actually an interventional nephrologist, right? So I work on dialysis access too. Mm -hmm. So I can do a, what we call a vein mapping and ultrasound of the arm. I can get you to uh, do that today on you. I can get you sent to the surgeon next week and I can have that access maturing in the next few weeks. Yeah. Whereas can, if you're can you explain maturing? Cause I was, that's maturing. what I was hoping you would, you would talk about when I asked why do you there not you wait to the very end where Hey, it's an emergency. I need dialysis now. Why put the access in earlier instead of waiting till the emergency? And the yeah. answer is maturing. Can you explain what maturing is? Absolutely. So maturing is the, is key. Okay. So with a fistula, a fistula is your own vein, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens is, I want you guys to look at your arm right now. You guys see that blue vein right there? Little blue veins in your in your elbow area. Those oh, are yeah. the veins we're using when we're creating a fistula. Okay. You guys can probably yeah. see mine. Your 20, is, 25 inch pythons. Nurses, there? 20, oops, you can't, yeah. Nurses love mine. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> they can see you got that pale white the, skin. You have that pale white skin, yeah. right? They're, like, <laughs> and they're they're across the room. If they're a new nurse doing my labs, they're like, ooh, <laughs> they know. Yeah, we're gonna get it the first try. No problem there. Yeah. So that vein, that's your vein. Okay. So your vein is yay big, right? It's like mm -hmm. probably. Two, uh, two, uh, 24 millimeters, which is like very small, like very small, sm small vein. What they do is take that vein and connect it to your artery. The artery is what's pumping blood. When you check a pulse over here on your arm, when you check that pulse, boom, 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 that's your artery. Mm -hmm. So they take that vein connected here. When they connect it to that vein, that vein to that artery, that vein gets bigger. It gets all this good flow. Okay. All this flow, that flow will actually cause that vein to get bigger and bigger and thicker and thicker. Okay. So it'll actually get bigger and bigger. And when it gets bigger and bigger, it takes time for it to get bigger and bigger. So typically a fistula will take about, let's say six to eight weeks to three months, depending on the person. Okay. So it'll take, it'll, it'll take anywhere from probably about two to months, two to three months for it to mature. Mm -hmm. So that's why we like to get it early because I can't wait. I, it's not like I can just put a fistula in and have it work, get you to dialysis. It takes several months for the fistula to heal. Now, if you have a yep. graft, on the other hand, the graft takes about two weeks to heal. Okay. But again, like uh, what I was getting, the point I was getting at James is I'm in a big city in a big group that has logistical yeah, you've support. You've got all those resources. I, it's I easy got the to resources. I can make some calls. I can get everything done. You're, if you're in a small town, America, 
if you're in rural America, if you're in, say, you're in a pra- you, nephrologist is a small practice, one to two physicians. Again, nothing wrong with those practices, by the way. You guys, are, those are excellent doctors. In the, I know several doctors in smaller practices. Nothing wrong with them. But the logistical support may not be there. The calls to get that done stuff quickly may not be there. So it may take several months to even get you the ultrasound. Do you see what I'm yeah. saying? To get that appointment for the ultrasound. After that, several months or several weeks to get the, the surgery. After that, several months of healing. And then sometimes it doesn't heal right, and you got to do some ballooning of it, which I do, the ballooning of the fistula. So th- it can take time. And that's why oftentimes they say GFR less than 30, you start recommending for thinking about fistula access. And that's why. Yep. Now, again, I wait for about 20 uh, or, fa- or rapidly declining uh, uh, GFR. But again, everyone's a little different, right? So, um, go ahead. Now, and if if I um, if I don't start planning early, which is definitely the way to go, start planning early, get it in, let it heal. Mm-hmm. How do they do it in an emergency? And what's if, what's if this an emergency? Compare? Okay, so the emergency. You know what? Yeah. One day I'm going to bring these catheters in. I got I have them in the office. I'm going to ring them on the That'll show. That'll be scary okay, so to see them. Yeah. So I, cause I put them in all the time. So, yeah. so you get, if you get them, you have a catheter put in your neck here into your internal jugular vein. That catheter comes out of your, your neck here. That's the emergency catheter. The long-term catheter actually comes out in your chest area right here. And it's two prongs coming down like this. One, yep. one prong, uh, one prong to actually take the blood out of you, one to put the blood back in. So, um, you don't want to be in that situation. And again, what, what's going on right now in, in, in medicine right now, and especially in uh, nephrology, especially in nephrology, is the, the, we want to have a, a clean start, a nice start, and a, a non-hospital start. So we want mm-hmm. to have everything ready in the arm, get you to do everything outpatient, never be admitted to the hospital. Not just because of COVID now, because this, uh, COVID does make a difference now, because you don't want to be in the hospital as much as you can. But in general, the hospitalization is what's so expensive. And not yeah. expensive, but... It's more traumatic on you. You guys, you got to stay five, six, seven days in a hospital, you know, waiting for them to place you in a dialysis unit. I'd rather you just do everything outpatient, get placed yep. in a dialysis unit and go from there. So again, that's the, when the talk of um, GFR of, of less than 30 is when um, dialysis access is really talked about. Okay. Yeah. Now, and that'll give you, you happen- the feeling of being in control by starting early <laughs> and planning for this compared to when I was in the ICU. They wanted to start dialysis, and I was thinking, I was like, wait, how does it hook up to my arm? I wanted to know about it. Like, oh, no, no, it's not going to go in your arm. It's going in your neck. (laughs) We we got to start it here. It's going in your neck. And I was like, oh, what about the hot tubs and stuff? They're like, no, 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 those are gone. (laughs) Say goodbye. And the situation that he was in, guys, like, you know, when he went to the hospital, he was like literally drinking from a water hose. Like that's how much stuff they're throwing at you, right? Like there's mm-hmm. so much stuff oh, coming yeah. at you. I couldn't it's figure like, it out. It was just yeah. overwhelming. You never heard of creatinine. You never heard of GFR. You never heard of potassium. I didn't never know heard what of renal failure was. They kept saying renal failure. And I'm like, what is a renal? What is renal? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And one, yeah. it was, I think it was the second day I asked the doctor, I said, wait, wait, I don't know what a renal is. What is a renal? And I was Googling yeah. it, but I was spelling it wrong. And it can, I would see kidney and I'd ignore that because it's not kidney. They would have said kidney. And then she explained yeah. your kidneys. And I thought, it can't be my kidneys. Yeah. yeah. And that's one of my missions in life is never to get rid of the words renal and nephrology from kidney care, mm-hmm. because I think it just intimidates people and they don't know what it is. Right. So yeah, exactly. you're going to have an effective mission, mission about preventing kidney disease or kidney health, we have to drop those terms because people can't relate to them, right? Cardiology has mm-hmm. kind of permeated the society, so we all know. We've heard that on, on the TV shows. Ne- cardiology, yeah, nephrology doesn't get any arrest. play. Yeah, yeah, nephrology doesn't get any play. We don't get any cool shows over nephrologists. You know, we're not like those kind of doctors, you know? <laughs> we so, do now have be um, positive, though. I'm not a big fan of that one. Which one? Be positive on CBS. No, uh, That's a show? <laughs> yeah, it's a, guy, a show. The guy has kidney failure. He needs a kidney, and he finds one in the the first episode from a stranger. And life um, is great for him. And he goes and does dialysis. And you don't want to watch it. You'll be like, "That's not dialysis." Oh my god! <laughs> but it's yeah, TV yeah. dialysis. <laughs> yes, you. <laughs> I bet you all the nurses are hot, and like the doctor is like gorgeous, and like yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. but there's just four no. of them in the chairs. He he looks fine. He has no access. 
Oh. And they they put a band on with tubes. Yeah. 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 And then they take him off and he's fine. He goes on the rest of his day doing stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, what we're getting at is guys, again, get involved early. Uh, when you're seeking, when you have GFR 50, 55, whenever you get first referred to nephrologist, get, get that, get, um, you know, get involved. Now, the other marker is GFR of 30, but also the next marker is GFR of 20. Okay, so GFR mm-hmm. of 20, um, I would say at that point, one thing is going to happen for sure is um, you uh, we won't find, excuse me, not for sure, but you should be referred to a, for a kidney transplant evaluation at that point. Okay, so if your GFR yes. hits 20 or less, go to the transplant center. Do not be afraid. They're not going to give you the transplant right then and there. They're not going to ask you all these, but they are going to give you education about transplant. They're going to ask you, see if you're a good candidate for transplant. You guys mm-hmm. got to remember, not everybody gets a kidney transplant. Not everyone can qualify. You first off have to be healthy. You have to be yep. cancer free. You have to have good heart condition. Um, there's a lot of things you have to be. You a have to be compliant weight, as a patient. If you're, a this is a weight, good time yes. to find out you're a little overweight and start working on it so that if yeah. the time comes, BMI, you can be. BMI is 35. Is a lot of times are, are the cut off depending on the transplant center. Every transplant center is different though, but BMIs of 35 or, or greater are kind of a cut off. So they'll say, hey, you got to lose 30 pounds before we give it to you. Okay, so. Yep. The get referred early and then you get on the list and start getting worked up and blah, blah, blah. Then you can see if you, anybody in your life is willing to donate to you. You know, mm-hmm. uh, Sharon Klung, Sharon Klug right there is a, I have a GFR of thir- 15. I don't know where you are, Sharon, what state you're in or what country you're in. But definitely refer uh, see if you can get evaluated for kidney transplant. So, yes. um, you know, and, and not just one list. Mm-hmm. Get on, go to multiple centers that are within a reasonable drive for you. Yeah, yeah, you can do that as well, too. And so, you know, and uh, I've had patients do it in m- different states and stuff, too. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying to do that. You know, um, yeah, it's always good to be at your local center because you can always get there quick, right? Yeah. Like they're going to call you and be like, hey, we got a kidney for you. And you got to get there at a certain time, right? So, yep. Uh, again, so it's GFR of 20, definitely there. The other thing I would refer to, if your GFR hits less than 30, I would ask your doctor to see if they have any education for you. Right. So we have a home therapies program at my, my dial, my, uh, my group. Right. So we actually have a home therapies educator that actually comes to your home, dude. They come to Ooh. your home, evaluate your house to make sure. Cause again, home dialysis, oh. to, uh, home dialysis is not for everybody. You have to have certain criteria to get home dialysis. Right. So, um, so you ha- house has to be clean, okay? Some of y'all, yep. I know you need to pick up some. You guys got to pick up some. You know this, right? That's why I, 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 I don't trust screen. James's bedroom either. Clean. I don't trust James. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I have dogs. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so the thing is, you it, animals. You can have animals, but you got to have a clean room, y'all. So if mm-hmm. you want to have home dialysis, either hemodialysis or peritoneal, you got to have a home, uh, have a clean house, uh, clean room that they they're not in. I know you think you know your little puppy is adorable and blah 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 blah, but it's dirty. It's dirty. Yeah, they're dirty. Okay? They're not clean. The, they're, they're dirty. So if they start licking you when on your PD site or your dialysis site, that's not very good. Ooh, so yeah. you have to have a clean room. You have to make sure you have edu- you know proper electricity, proper water, that you're capable of doing it, proper you know all that kind of stuff. A good room, um, so a separate room, whatever it is. So um, that's another thing. So our, our 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 educator can have you, and they can have you at the the home therapies program as well too. And when they do that, they can demonstrate all the machines and give you all the education. So when your GFR hits less than thirty, you guys seek out the education. You understand me? So you can, if you're with a, uh, you ask that nephrologist, what dialysis centers do you work with? Then typically the ones they are is uh, Fresenius, which is a big one. David yep. is the biggest. Then Fresenius. Then I'm with, uh, our group is with the U.S. Renal, which is a great, great program mm-hmm. as well. Then there's these smaller providers out there and smaller ones. But you ask that nephrologist, who do you work with? You ask them, hey, do you have a home therapies program? Okay. You ask them that don't wait for them to don't wait for that nephrologist to bring it up. And that's been the problem. I think a lot of us in nephrologists, we're, we're the ones offering it or think about it. And sometimes the patients don't really think about it. So you guys think about it and ask them and say, does, do they have an educator? And then yep. you can go get educated. And, and I and had so had never it. heard about that. That's the first time I've heard about that. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, you can get an educator, and they can come to your house, and they'll do the home eval, the whole nine. So you get that stuff done early, and then the other thing I want y'all to do is get your family involved, guys. Don't think this this whole thing is by yourself. I, I explain. I know a lot of guys out there are really stubborn, and they don't tell their wives anything. And you know, some people are just very secretive. But if you're, uh, you know, you're 
older or even by your, uh, even younger, 40, 50 years old, get your wife involved, get your husband involved, get your kids involved, get your so, so, social support system involved and say, hey, we're going to go for this education together. Okay. And that way you guys can get educated and understand what's going on with you, with yourself. And that way you're not alone in the whole thing. Right. And then they explain, Hey, I'm bringing this giant VCR next to my bed. It's not a VCR, by the way, it's a PD yeah. <laughs> meeting machine. But, <laughs> I've seen but, it looks like an old VCR, like a beta VCR. machine, really old. I got a post today. I actually had one of my patients get a new, uh, new machine from Baxter. It, it's amazing. It's got like a, almost like an iPad kind of sc- screen on there Ooh. and it's got all the buttons to teach you how exactly how to do everything. It's super cool. But, yeah. um, but yeah, Be- Beverly Christian, you, I live alone. Okay. If you're a late stage kidney disease, you can still do peritoneal dialysis. So you may want to ask your nephrologist about that. Okay. So even if you live alone, you can do peritoneal. The home hemodialysis where you stick yourself, that may be more difficult. Um, not all machines can do that. So that's an option for you. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's so, great. but anyway, so get your social and, support and involved. Beverly was asking, does insurance I, I pay for dialysis? These, these home visits, who's paying for all that? So, it, so you got to remember, so uh, in, in the United States, Medicare is a age qualifying insurance, right? Medicare program mm-hmm. is an age qualifying insurance, right? At 65, we all qualify for it. It's age qualifying. Well, there is a diagnosis out there that actually qualifies you for Medicare before age 65. And that diagnosis is ESRD, end stage renal disease, right? So if you get end stage renal disease, and this was actually brought in by Nixon in 1972, that mm-hmm. you actually qualify for the, uh, me- Medicare. So you, as long as you've paid in the the, the, the 10 years or four, four, 40 quarters into Medicare, you qualify for Medicare at that point. And even if you haven't worked and your spouse has, um, uh, has worked that 40 years, um, sorry, like a stay-at-home mom kind of thing, um, that for, not 40 years, 40, 40 quarters, which is 10 years, Yep. then um, you you qualify. So you you will if you don't have insurance, you will likely have insurance. Now some people don't have won't qualify for Medicare. They may qualify for Medicaid, but other things you likely will get it. Okay, so that's not that shouldn't be a problem as far as dialysis and even home dialysis. So you said you were, maybe she was asking about home dialysis. Medicare covers yeah. it. Your and then if you have private insurance, your private insurance should cover you for dialysis for the first twenty seven months or three years or something like that. Something to that effect. And then Medicare kicks in, right? So you will be you should be covered with the home. And actually with the home stuff, they are going to push home more than in center now. They want yes. you to do home. So with the, with the executive order that Trump signed. Uh, yes. Two years ago or a year ago? Yeah, so, it was 2017. About? I think 2020 is kind of a damper. And actually, I'm doing a presentation on it. I'll, I'll share it with you too, um, uh, James, when I do it. But uh, doing it for university here. And it's about the, the the Medicare models that they come, the payment models they come up yeah. with. And it's the update. So I did a presentation on it uh, on YouTube about two, a year ago. I'm going to update it. So, um, but yeah. So, uh, but they're going to be pushing this this type of analysis. And the reason why, because people have better outcomes. People have better outcomes with their labs. People have better outcomes with their uh, mortality, how long they yes. live. People it's have better outcomes. It's less stress on your heart because you're doing a little bit every night yeah. instead of going in certain days of the week and yeah, doing more absolutely. at an end center. Yeah, absolutely. So, and um, Deb has a great question that definitely applies to me too. Mm-hmm. Um, she says she's seen the one in the abdomen. She lives alone, yeah. but she tosses and turns at night. So do I, Deb. <laughs> When in the mm-hmm. all the pillow, all the cushions, all the comforter, everything all ends up just in a big old pile right mm-hmm. on me. Um, are you able to do that if you toss and turn at night? That is a very good question. And you know what? Um, I think you're supposed to stand still. This is a good question for a PD nurse. And you know what? I didn't. Oops, we lost your audio, Doc. Oh, we lost your audio. Hold on one second. <laughs> We can't hear you. Oh, are you serious? There, okay. There, I can hear you. I heard you there. Got You're me? back. You're back. Yeah. Okay. okay go I'm ahead. back. I'm back, guys. I'm back, guys. Don't touch James cut me or... off. James cut me off. James cut me off, dude. If you just want me to shut up, just shut me up. Shut up. Okay. <laughs> it's that Windows computer. If you had a Mac, it would work great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm starting to regret it. Whatever. Okay. So, but yeah, no, that's an excellent question for the PD nurses. But yeah, it could be a possibility. But again, uh, the girl at uh, the late, excuse me, Leah asked that. You yeah, need Deb. to get educated. Talk to the home home programs with whatever provider your um, your nephrologist works with, and see. Uh, it's a great experience. It could be. It can be a great experience. So. Yep. Yeah. 
All right, so, great. So oh. the, 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 I, I interrupted you there with that question, but I saw that and I'm like, I'm the same way. I would want that version because it's easier to do mm-hmm. at home, but I toss and turn. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Can I bring up another point real quick? Sure, so, yeah. This is, this, this is what's fascinating. You, so you had Shuvo Roy on, I remember. He talked about yes, the artificial yes. kidney. I know all y'all are out there are like, artificial kidney, artificial kidney, blah, 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 blah. I'm excited about it, blah, 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 you know, everything. And that's probably 10 to 15 years down the road, yeah. somewhere around there, right? So At least 10 what's years. Interesting, and so we're talking about, I, was, I actually had a separate conversation with Shuvo Roy. I got to, got to meet him. Great guy, great guy. But what you got to remember is you know we're doing home therapies like we are right now with home hemodialysis with the machines in the arm or or peritoneal dialysis with the machine here but as we're developing the 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 artificial kidney what is so cool is you what you realize is you're invent advent, miniaturizing and inventing new technologies to make everything smaller right guys so you're trying to make that artificial kidney smaller right so you're taking a machine that's this big and you're trying to get into an artificial kidney that's this big but along the way you're using t- nanotechnology or whatever other types of technology to make things smaller. Guess what? Not you know we don't have to go from like current dialysis to artificial kidney. We can go from miniaturized uh, from miniaturized home he- home hemo. You see what I'm right. saying? Right. The eye hemo, which he said is only about, about five hemo. years away. Yeah. So along the way here, guys, as we're developing the artificial kidney, you may not get an artificial kidney now, but. In maybe five years, the technology that they're using to create the artificial kidney, you may have a nicer, easier, gradual form of dialysis that you can do at home. And so this is what's cool about what's going on in kidney care right now. I think there's a lot of development going on. I've actually seen a lot of um, startup start and insurance companies get involved about kidney care, particularly that they're kind of, you know, they're going to invent more and more things to kind of make home dialysis better. And this is what great right about that Trump executive order. It's, it's really going to stimulate a lot of people. It's changed the mindset of a lot of dialysis and, and, it, and a lot of it's, it's different. It's a different mindset now, like in center hemodialysis was the standard of care for the longest time and just automatic for the most part now we're really pushing that so along the way guys you may not get an artificial kidney in the next few years but you may get a better form of dialysis because of it you know and that's another reason why if the time comes to go on dialysis because it could you know you may go on dialysis and then all of a sudden the ihemo or something else comes out that makes dialysis even easier and less of a change to your life so it's you know, it's just another yeah. reason why if if you need dialysis see it as not only buying you time to get a transplant but buying you time for something better to come along absolutely absolutely just i, I really want y'all to change your mindset about how i realize I, what i realize is for most of us that the, the mindset you approach something is the way you experience it mm-hmm. so if you go all in negative nancy into something dialysis is gonna suck it's going to suck. But if you go on with a positive attitude saying, I'm going to learn this, I'm going to have a good life. I'm going to do this and that. I'm going to make a social support net. I'm going to have friends on dialysis, whatever it is, you know, social support groups, you will have a good experience. You see what I'm saying? Yep. So that that's, that's how I, I put my approach to life in general. But I, I really believe I've seen people even on in-center dialysis we're knocking in-center dialysis. I've seen people have good, good outcomes and make a family, a circle of friends and those, and those centers too. So, Yep. And, and we've spoken to dialysis nurses at the dialysis centers. Mm-hmm. They've talked about how people will bring in a ukulele. They're like family. You know, it's this family yeah. you have a really close relationship and understanding with because you're all going through this similar experience of kidney disease. What's funny is people even develop chair buddies. Like the dude that sits next to him becomes their homeboy, yep. right? Or their, their BFF or whatever it is, right? So... Um, you notice that people happen and, and, uh, and occasionally logistically in the dialysis unit, we have to switch up the chairs or switch up the techs or whatever it is. Right. And mm-hmm. sometimes if we move people away from their chair, buddy, they are ticked. Like they are ticked. Like it's because they lost their friend. Right. Yep. And they want that friend there. So again, uh, I, I approach it with a positive attitude. I know it sounds miserable, but it's approach it with a positive attitude. Always ask your neurologist questions. Okay. Um, yep. then the, uh, go ahead. Now, now there, there's a no. question here that's been asked a couple times, which I think is a great one. Um, have you had any experience with ellipsis? I'm not going to pronounce that. Yeah, or the con- ellipsis. So I was actually considering training with that, getting a training on that. So I'm an interventional nephrologist, right? So the axis is, I don't put the axis in the arm, right, guys? I don't put the axis, sorry, there's one. Axis is in the arm. I don't put the axis. I work on them after. So I'm not the engineer, I'm the mechanic, right? 
Um, so I do everything percutaneously. And what that means is I go through the skin, past wires, past balloons, past dents, and that's how I work, right? Um, uh, the surgery, the, the fistula creation is actually a surgery. You make an incision, open up things, move veins, arteries, all that kind of stuff, and, um, you know, suture them together, all that kind of stuff. What's great about the ellipsis, and there's another one called Wavelink, they actually allow you to make a fistula uh, with, um, without making a cut, just doing everything percutaneously. Yeah. Ooh. So you, uh, you, you can actually pass a, 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 a excuse me, a, a, a wire down here and the ellipsis, I forgot how the mechanism works. I think it, it but they actually take, it, it finds an artery and vein that are close together and makes a hole in between them, creating a fistula. And so that's done underneath the skin. No, uh, no cuts, no knees, needles. No, so you no, don't have that I big scar. You, you don't have that big scar. You don't have that oh. big scar. Yeah, but the thing is, not everybody qualifies for it. So your 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 anatomy and your veins have to be a particular size. Your anatomy has to be in a certain way for them to do ellipsis or for them to do the wavelength. The other one as well too. I'm trying to get trained in it. I'm going to see how that goes. Um, but there are interventional nephrologists like myself. Not all nephrologists are interventional, by the way. Um, uh, but the interventional nephrologists are trying to do it, and I'll see if I can do it. So. Yeah. Cool. So we've had, a, we have a few people who are like me, not experienced with dialysis. Um, someone asked, is it painful? So is it, is it painful getting your access in? And then what's it like it, getting dialysis? Oh, okay. So, uh, getting the access in. So typically if it's a surgery, you are, it's, it's, it's usually a day surgery, right guys? So it's a day surgery. You go in the morning, you come out in the afternoon, whatever it is. The surgery doesn't take long, half an hour, hour, not very long surgery at all. It's a minor surgery. Now you do need probably you may, depending on your condition, you may need cardiac clearance, meaning your cardiologist has to approve the surgery. You do are put to sleep for it, meaning they mm -hmm. do put you to sleep for it. Um, they put a tube in your throat, anesthesia is there the whole nine. And so they put you to sleep for it. Um, does it hurt? That's an interesting question because it's a subjective experience, right? It's hard to tell mm -hmm. if it hurts, um, but it is a minor surgery. Now, some people do have complications where they have pain, where they have numbness and all this kind of stuff, but generally, yep. no, it's not. Now, as far as the fit, uh, after the axis is created and you started on dialysis, I'm not going to lie to you, probably the first few sticks are going to hurt right? You're going into the vein, you're using a pretty big needle. They typically start with like, uh, what is it? Um, 17, 18, eight gauge needles. And, um, and they progress it to 15 gauge, the small, the smaller, the number, the bigger the, the needle guys. So it's, it's opposite. Um, so, um, anyway, so they start with big needles and they go into the fistula. So it hurts initially. Now, initially they may use lidocaine, uh, a numbing medication or a numbing mm -hmm. cream. So those of you people on dialysis, they can use a numbing cream. Um, but after a while, even without the numbing cream, you, your that area becomes kind of dead and it becomes kind of like scar tissue, right? So it doesn't hurt quite as much. And quite honestly, you get used to it, right? So it can, you can have problems with it later on too, as far as it hurting, but it's usually, it, take, it takes time. Again, I'm talking from someone who's never been stuck. I, I stick. Yeah. Right? So, <laughs> so, uh, well, I'm glad to yeah, hear no, they like, put you to sleep when they do it. I've had a few surgeries. Yeah. Um, <laughs> When I was in my late 20s, I went and got a bunch of liposuction. They put me out for that because it was from neck to knee. Um, and then I had uh, my gallbladder removed, and they put me out for that. Um, I yeah. actually loved both times being put out. I never wanted to wake up. I am very bad at waking so, up from those things. So this is the thing, guys. So like my procedures, when you work on them afterwards, I don't put you to sleep. I may give you a little bit of sedation. It's called conscious sedation, where mm -hmm. you kind of just take the edge off or get groggy or something like that. But you have to remember when you're doing a procedure, whatever it is, it's, it's, you have to manage risk and reward ratio here, right? Risk benefit re analysis, sorry, not risk reward, risk, risk benefit analysis. My procedures are minor. So I don't want to put you to sleep for a minor procedure, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's a lot of risk to put a human being to sleep. Like you may not wake up. You may not take, take time to get off the vent. Major procedures like you had, you know, where you got all the fat sucked out of you, apparently, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like not all yeah, of it. I wish yeah. more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, but, I you know. did it back in the olden days when it was, it was not a good procedure and it, oh, it took man. a long time to recover about three months to recover. But, and wow, then I undid wow. it all as I started eating badly later. <laughs> wow. 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 But yeah, so the, the experience there, the other marker is, um, so we talked about GFR 30, GFR mm. 20. Um, I would say, uh, Gene says, yeah, those needles hurt. I'm sure they do. I'm not trying to under, under, uh, under, under, what does it say? 
under under act. What am I, what word am I using here? So uh, under, under. I know what you saying. mean, but I don't know the word. You know what I mean, right? Yeah, I'm losing <laughs> yeah. my vocabulary apparently as I talk here. So um, I'm not trying to underplay, underplay you your go. suffering, underplay your suffering. But yeah, they do hurt, and but yeah. So we talked about GFR of thirty being one you could need to get educated, may need to get air access. GFR of twenty, mm-hmm. you got to get your kidney tra- get I value for kidney transplant, maybe even get that access yep. in. GFR of fifteen. GFR 15 is typically the average of where dialysis is started. It's the average, guys. It's not the absolute cutoff, mm-hmm. okay? So GFR 15 is the average. So I've started people on dialysis, GFR 17, 18. I've started G- people on dialysis, GFR 8. Depends on the person, right? Depends on the person. And what I mean depends on the person, depends on their labs. Is their potassium okay? Oh, is their, is their bicarbonate, is their acid levels okay? Um, or, and can they be managed medically? Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, are they having any swelling or shortness of breath? Can they be managed medically, meaning with me- medicines? Right? Um, uh, how are they feeling? How are they feeling? Do they feel weak, tired, fatigued, nauseous? Right? F- uh, mm-hmm. Metallic taste to their mouth, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, kind of. How is the quality of life? Can they continue with the symptoms, yes. or are the symptoms yeah. just so overwhelming that it's time? Mm-hmm. To start. Yeah, and it's called uremia, guys. It's called uremia. It's typically when your BN gets really high. All the, the your BN, BN uh, on your labs, if you guys look at them, is a reflection of the toxins building up. So the higher your BN, the more toxins you got build up. And when it gets too high, you get uremic, and that's when you feel weak, tired, fatigued, nauseous, uh, well, food tastes funny, all that funny stuff. So yep. when when your symptoms feel bad, you feel bad. Again, there's no absolute cutoff of GFR. There's no absolute cutoff of creatinine. I'm getting the question on that. What's my which what creatinine do my should I start dialysis? It's not it's not bad. It's your individual symptoms. It's your individual labs, and it's in your individual, you know, how you feel overall. So, that's the subjective kind of thing. But when you're getting close to GFR of 15, that's when you gotta be like, man, dialysis is coming soon. So that's the other uh, cutoff right there, where I would be like, hey, this is what what we need to. I need to brace myself because at any point. You know, again, th- I want you to think about GFR 15. We say 15 percent, but think about it like this: that's 15 cents on the dollar. That's what you got mm-hmm. in your kidneys right now. You see what I'm saying? So that's any a, a sneeze can put it over the edge. You see what I'm saying? Like <laughs> anything, can go, I can't, I can't, I can't tell you it can last forever. Now the thing is, I've had patients with GFRs of 15 that lasted two, three years. Honestly, mm-hmm. I've had those, but then I've had people with GFRs of 15 that last two, three months. So, but at that point, uh, again, a sneeze can put you over. Not a sneeze, but you know, you yeah. know what I'm saying. It doesn't any, take much. It, it doesn't yeah. take much. You know. That ibuprofen, 800 milligrams times three, you know, three oh, for a week will put you over, you know? So, yeah, definitely none. Yeah, barely yeah. saying she heard GFR five. Uh, wow. Yeah, I'm the lowest mine was, was eight, and life was, for me, miserable. Um, mm-hmm. I, I felt like this was it. I'm, I'm dying. This is what dying feels like. When yeah. I was that way, and even at, when they got me up to 13 while in the ICU, even when I left the hospital, and my parents probably remembered the the very next day, they came down to visit me, and we went to a mall parked right outside the food court, and I walked into the mall to get to a table, and it was like that old Carol Burnett show, Carol Burnett, mm-hmm. the old guy that took the teeny tiny little steps. It took forever. It took me forever to get from my car to the table. And then I had to go to the restroom. And oh, I wow. I bet you it took me at least 15 minutes to walk to that very close restroom that I could see. And I kept stopping, leaning on a wall, catching my breath. And I remember my dad came over, he's like, are you okay? I eventually made it into the restroom. Uh, oh, I, it probably took me round trip just because of how exhausted I was. and. Even with that GFR 13, I know it was probably 45 minutes to go to the bathroom and come back. Wow. And so, so difficult. Um, so uh, can, I, can I say yeah. something to that effect yeah, yeah. too, guys? So, you know, you're talking about your symptoms. You're being honest about your symptoms. A lot of people are not honest about their symptoms when they come to that doctor's office, oh, right? I wasn't so, at first either. I, mm-hmm. I, 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 I'm being honest here on what the symptoms were. But when I Mm -hmm. first saw my primary care physician, as my kidneys were failing, I I was like, I'm not going to tell my uh, there's blood in my urine. I'm not going to tell about this metallic taste in my mouth. uh, I I, I told him I can't sleep at night. I got a headache. I wake up. My bed is soaked with sweat. Uh, I told him about a few of the symptoms, but I kept so many of them 
from him. And yeah. that only hurt me because he didn't yeah. notice my kidneys were starting to fail until mm -hmm. they failed. And he, yeah. I remember going in and he's like, you, we need labs. You got to go to the emergency room. And I told him, I, I clearly remember this. Oh, doc, I've got things I got to do. I'll go tomorrow. And he's like, no, you're going now yeah. or I'm calling an ambulance. You pick which yeah. way. And my vision yeah. was almost gone. My blood pressure was so bad. My vision had gotten so blurry and I didn't even tell him about that. Um, yeah. so I remember I, driving I to the ER. Lady, you're yeah, yeah, my car was just beeping at me because I was getting too close to the lines constantly. And it kept pushing me back into the road. I shouldn't even have been yeah. driving. It was bad. Wow. But yeah, so I've had a similar lady, um, old, older lady. She was probably around 70 something. Mm -hmm. I think she passed now, but I remember her specifically because I used to see her specifically because I used to see her once a month, right? Because her GFR was so low, but she did not want dialysis. So she would not, she would not tell me that she doesn't feel, I feel fine. I feel fine. I feel fine. Right. All, all the time. And I could tell she looked <sighs> weaker. Right. I could physically tell when she came to my office, I look weaker. I look weaker. Uh, she says she looks weaker. Excuse me. And um, and when we finally convinced her, I remember her daughter used to come every time to go on dialysis. She, when she was on dialysis, she looks so much better. She looks oh, so yeah. much better because she got her, you know, the, 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 they started cleaning her blood. She got more vibrant, you know, um, all mm -hmm. that stuff that I'm trying to manage medically is all of a sudden managed by the machine, which is doing a better job. But she just looked more lively or more happy. You see what I'm saying? So, again, that you guys can push it off to the end. You know, don't get me wrong. I will keep you off dialysis as long as we can. Mm -hmm. but I want you to have a good quality of life at the end. Yeah. And, and so. sharing, you know, it, I learned a lesson. I need to be honest with my doctors and tell them. And now I probably over tell them. Um, I did a, yeah. a virtual checkup maybe three days ago and my doctor was asking me, okay, how are things? Well, you know, my arm's a little sore from my desk. <laughs> I'm telling you about that. I put a compression sleeve on it. It's okay. Yeah. He said too much. Yeah. I think when you leave it open-ended, then it's, everything comes out. Right. But yeah. let me tell you about but honestly, happy. I was in he's clinic. He's glad to hear that. Huh? He's yeah, glad to I hear that, that I'm not hiding things or keeping things from him. Yeah, and so like today, I had a patient come in for the first time today, see me for kidney disease, and he straight up just told me I do cocaine, man. I snore cocaine, mm -hmm. and I actually appreciated his honesty because I understand that I know what I'm dealing with. You see what yeah. I'm saying? Not that I'm judging him, but I know that hey, th this could be a contributing factor to, to his kidney disease. That this can be mm -hmm. a contributing factor to his blood pressure. That this can be a contributing factor to a lot of things that are going on in his life. Um, so that opened it up. You see what I'm saying? So again, yep. not judging them. I just need to know. And I actually did a video about that too. How, uh, how, you know, how you can move your doctor's appointment better, but like mm -hmm. being honest is huge guys. Just be honest. Yes. Like I'm not, if you're not taking the medication, don't tell me you're taking the medication. Then I, I won't wonder why the blood pressure is high on three medications. You see what I'm saying? Exactly. So it's, Cause it's then you might prescribe to... different medication when that one really was working. Yeah. Yeah. Or I, and then, then you take all four medications because I added another one and you bought them out. Right. So like it, it's, it's better to just be honest, just be honest. And you know, again, don't treat your doctor like your friend, but treat your doctor like it's your consultant, right? Mm -hmm. He's there to help you. She's there to help you. Right. So yep. if you want help, just treat them like the consultant, like the, the person that's going to tell you, give the advice and you implement it or so, but yeah. Yeah. We have a few other people are mentioning a few of the other, uh, um, symptoms of low kidney disease. Uh, so yeah. about the cold and the nauseous. I remember my teeth chattering so much, the blankets on heated blankets and still being cold. Um, yeah. that was star. Yeah. That that's one of the symptoms of, it got pretty nasty when my kidneys were failing. And even that one, I didn't tell my doctor I'm constantly freezing. I'm always cold. I yeah. wish I would have. He could have seen the symptoms and recognized them instead of me hiding them all and trying to just tell him a little bit. Cause I, I was convinced yeah. it was food poisoning. I, I was certain it's food poisoning. Yeah. All I need is a few more bottles of Peptol, Pepto-Bismol and some other antacids and stuff. And mm, wasn't good. Yeah. All right. We are almost at the top of the hour. Anything else we need to know for preparing for dialysis? We've talked about a lot already including the importance of starting the conversation, the education early, mm -hmm. uh, getting your access done early mm -hmm. so you don't end up with an emergency in the neck, giving it time to heal. Um, you and Referring I next month in January, we'll talk about 
possibly the veins and strengthening those. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to yeah. be talking to, I uh, guess, a Dr. Uh, Te- uh, Tej Singh, right? Uh, yes. Great guy. I talked to him, and I think you talked to him as well, too. He's developing it. For people out there that are uh, getting an access in the arm, he's actually developed a device. It's a cuff that actually helps your veins kind of dilate and get bigger, which may help you, your access to heal in your arm. Uh, I, I, your access to heal better in your arm and mature better in your arm. So yep. that's going to be a great conversation. We can just talk about kidney disease and stuff like that. And, and that kidney disease, uh, fistula placements and graft placements. And all Maybe that then you can bring your, your bring them on, show us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll actually do that. Remind me, James. You're going to email me. Hey, I will. I'll the, remind you on the that catheters. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'll, I'll bring it on for sure at that time. So. Yep. Anything else we need, though, to prepare? I mean, we've covered a lot so far. Uh, yeah, just again, uh, G- uh, G- let's go over again. GFR 30, refer for, uh, think about access. We'll get the education about dialysis at that point. Talk to your nephrologist. You ask them, do you have a home therapies program? Please get me education. GFR 20, I want to refer for a kidney transplant. Get me on the list, blah, blah, blah. Let me, get me see the center. Um, and at some point, you know, between GFR 30 and 20 or 15 and 15, you need to get an access place in your arm, get the ultrasound of your arm vein mapping. It's called and get the access place or get decided to PD to the PD. And then GFR 15 is when you're close to dialysis. Can I say something else about PD? Oh, yeah, yeah. PD is initiated differently. So with you, with you're going to do the hemodialysis or uh, hemodialysis, either in center or home hemo, I wait till the end until you feel like crap. Okay. PD on the other hand, you don't want to start. Um, when you feel like crap, because you, I still have to put the catheter in you. I still have to get you training for it and everything. So typically that one, I will get, a, you, you start a little bit early, a little bit earlier than you would HD, but the, because the transition has to be smoother because you have training and it's gentler on you and all this other stuff. So I want, I want you to understand that the PD may be initiated a little bit earlier than HD. So. Awesome. All right. Well, this brings us pretty much to the top of the hour. For everyone who's watching live, tomorrow is the day before Christmas. So happy holidays to everyone. Stay safe and hopefully have a great Christmas. We're expecting snow here in Cincinnati tomorrow. So my kids and my dogs are going to be in heaven if we get some of it. (laughs) Now, are you doing anything special, Doc, for the holidays? I'm actually on call for the four days, so I'll be on the, uh, at the hospital and stuff. So, but no, but it's 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 great. Um, uh, we're, we're actually it's probably gonna be warm here. We're in Texas, so. Oh yes. Oh, <laughs> we never I, I see snow. Say, so. My wife's like, maybe we should be moving to Florida. She sees <laughs> some relatives of ours that are down there. Great weather, the ocean. It's like wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome, man. Awesome. So, All right, yeah. and for everyone else, a quick reminder, let's help Dr. Butt get to 1,000 subscribers. The important thing for 1,000 subscribers is he then gets a short URL instead of this long one with all these weird letters and numbers in it. So you're gonna search YouTube, your kidneys, your health, you'll see his picture, subscribe to it, lots of great content. There's also a direct link that will subscribe you when you click it in the description of this video. So go ahead and just click that one. It'll take you right to his YouTube channel and it'll activate the subscription for you. And if you haven't subscribed to Dad Vice TV, don't forget, click subscribe on that one too. Join the community here with great information. Now, Dr. Butt will be back in 2021. Hard to say, hard to believe it's <laughs> yeah, 2020 is, is a mulligan year. 2020 <laughs> is a mulligan year. You just want to forget it and pretend like it didn't happen, right? Exactly. So, and and yeah. 2021 be much, much, much better. Yeah. Back, back to normal eventually. That's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah. <laughs> now, I don't know if you saw the show last night, Doc. I shared a picture of my car, which I am looking mm-hmm. forward to 2021. Did you see that? No, no, I didn't. I didn't get to see that. Here's my car. Yeah. I'm going to be driving this around. That was snapped oh my while God. I was out and about. <laughs> oh my, is that the electric one? Is that the electric one? Yes, that is a plug-in hybrid. Wow. So it's plugged fancy. in the garage right now charging. It gets is- thir- about 30 miles on a full charge. It takes like eight hours plugged into the regular wall socket. <laughs> Oh my God. Oh, you don't you get it set up in the garage, like a fancy setup or whatever, a powered for like Tesla oh, that does that, right? Co- so the so the challenge is my garage is separated mm-hmm. and where the power comes in is the other side of the house. 
The garage was oh. not original. It was added on. So running enough electrical to the garage will cost me a fortune. And it'll only save me a few hours, like three or four hours a night. I plug it in at night when rates are cheap. Let's plug it in a regular outlet. It's fully charged by morning. And I don't drive very far. 30 miles on pure electric is mm -hmm. about enough. And then it has a, it also has a V6 as a backup engine. And you can hit a yeah. button and turn them both on and go really fast. <laughs> That's cool. Man. That's awesome. Yeah, I drive in the neighborhood on, on electric so that it's silent. And as soon as I get out on the real road, I, I activate both of the engines. So I, have well, the, I think the electric will be really good for a drive-by when you don't want anyone to know you're coming by, right? Just, exactly. It's a driving exactly. by the Dallas Center real slowly, <laughs> waving at everybody. Hey, go to the website. Visit it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. I will see, see you in two weeks, Doc. And everyone else, I am here next week. We got Jen Hernandez on Tuesday and maybe even one more show before the end of the year. Um, I'm working with a guy named Dax who created a clothing line for dialysis patients. He's a dialysis patient himself. And I'm, we're working at trying to get him in next week to talk about his dialysis clothing line has zippers that go all the way up, comfortable, easy to use. All oh, right, everybody. Cool. Yeah. And it's great. He started his own business while on dialysis because he was sitting there. He's like, okay, this, this is difficult. They need more clothing. It's comfortable. It looks good. Um, and he's kind of funny. He does these videos on Facebook. He's dancing. He's hooked up to the dialysis machine. He's doing mm -hmm. dialysis, doing TikTok videos, and making up his own words to songs that are very positive. You know, it's it's very inspiring watching him on dialysis, smile and dancing with these tubes coming off. <laughs> Which is probably not what we recommend for everyone, I'm guessing. <laughs> but it's great he's doing it. All right, everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks, Doc. Bye, Take everyone. Care,